What a joy that'll be, amen? Unbroken fellowship. It's going to be pretty cool. If you need a Bible, the ushers can come forward and just raise your hand and they'll get you a Bible. We need one over here. And also, we have some new invitations if you wanted to take a couple of these. If we run out, we'll make more. Uh, but these are things you can hand out and go, did you get one of these? See if you can say that. Did you get one of these? Pretty easy. Or here's another one. Take this. There you go. Evangelism 101. You guys are graduates now. So easy. You didn't know it was so easy. Amen. So let's pray before we get into God's word. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the verse by verse, chapter by chapter teaching of your word, Lord. I'm just so thankful for that, Father, that uh, you brought us to a place that taught the word. The name doesn't matter so much. What matters is your word. And Lord, as we get into your word, would you help us to, to glean everything that you want us to glean, that we would be so encouraged by heaven that, Lord, it motivates us, that it doesn't cause us to sit back on our heels, but actually causes us to run the race that is set before us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite passages in the entire Bible is that scene in Acts chapter 7, around the verse 55. And Stephen is getting to preach his first message. And man, is it a doozy, and it's got an edge to it. He's not being polite. And the religious leaders of the day are gnashing their teeth. They're so angry, and they stone him to death. Ministry over. But before he is stoned to death... God gives him a special treat. Listen to what it says in God's word. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You guys know your theology. Where is Jesus? He's seated at the right hand of God. But here it says he's standing. Why is he standing? Stephen, that's my boy. Good job. And I wonder if Stephen's like, Lord, couldn't I at least on a second message? What about the second service? But I think the most amazing part of this is we're getting a glimpse. He's given a glimpse into heaven. The heavens opened up. See, we can't see. There's a physical and a spiritual. And we can't see the spiritual. And from time to time, we'll see it opened up for a believer to see the kingdom of heaven. Paul said he was raised to the third heaven. But Stephen's ministry didn't last long. But it's interesting that God gave him that little gift right there because just minutes later, he's going to be dead and be in heaven anyways. So why did God do that? Maybe it was for us. So that we could know that we can look into heaven and be encouraged. That Jesus notices you when you're doing those little things. Picking up things out of the carpet or, or doing a little thing in a paintbrush or putting tile on the bathroom floor of the kids' ministry. See, we're in a new home here, and, and I'm so thankful for it. Well, let's, let's look at the transformation a little bit. Plus, we have a pretty cool picture of Arthur. You didn't know I took this picture. One of the members in the body made that sign, by the way. Amazing. Before, after. Before, after. Oh. Omar, our real estate agent's here. <laughs> Unbelievable, amen? He saw it when he came in here. It was like dusty and moldy. 
Unbelievable. And that's the children's wing. Just a hot mess back there, but look at it now. There used to be a wall separating the two rooms. And that was the nursing mother's room that was glass right there. We transformed that. It almost reminds me of what God's doing in my life with me. Making me fit for heaven. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> He was putting the insulation in the top part there. And people from other churches, uh, Calvary Chapel, Crystal River, they came over and did a bunch of drywall. They were here for days. Just unbelievable, the amount of help. It was awesome. Amen. Transformation. See, today we're in our new home, but I want to talk about our new home and not this one. I want to talk about our home in heaven. But one thing I do know about heaven is you don't need building permits. You don't need a building department because everything is already prepared ahead of time for us. I'm going to give us seven things that I've, the Lord touched my heart about. Seven things. If you're a note taker, we can get set up. First, real. Heaven is real. It's really real. Heaven is royal. Heaven is also regal. Heaven is a relief. Heaven is also quite roomy. Heaven is also a repository. You've got to be careful with that word, repository. And heaven is reserved. So let's get into it. Heaven is real. In the first chapter of Genesis, we're introduced to heaven. We're introduced to the king of heaven, but we read of God's creation. And in God's creation is a heaven. Actually, multiple heavens. And it's interesting that the last two chapters of the Bible, see, we study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Genesis begins with a picture of in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did the heavens and earth get here? Just making sure you're awake. God created them, right? It didn't happen by lightning striking ooze. Man, I wish I had faith like that. No, God created them. He spoke them into existence. That's why we worship him. But then he closes the book. Because you remember John says, if anyone adds or subtracts to the book of Revelation, let them be anathema. That's, that's serious business. He's like, don't you dare do it. Don't add or subtract. And he ends it by talking about heaven and what it's going to be like. You know, heaven is very real. 531 times heaven is mentioned, but in the Jewish mind we have to keep that clear because there's at least three different heavens. There's the firmament, that's where the birdies fly. There's the starry heavens where you see the starry host up there. And then there's the heaven of heavens, that's where God dwells. The word there is shemayim heights or elevate, uh, elevations. That's the one we most often mean, right? When we are trying to explain to a child that their grandfather has died and they say, where's grandpa? Oh, grandpa's in heaven. That's the heaven we're talking about. We can talk about the sky some other time where the birdies fly. But heaven goes by many names in the Bible. The Father's house. I like that. John described it thus. Paradise, paradiso. The heavenly Jerusalem. Book of Revelation. There's a new Jerusalem that comes down. That's us, guys. The new Jerusalem. The kingdom of heaven. The eternal kingdom. The eternal inheritance. It's also known as Abraham's bosom. I like this last one. The better country. USA, yeah, no. Heaven, heaven. It's a way better country. It wins the Olympics every time. But it's royal. Why is it so good? Because it's royally run. It's run by a righteous king. Our king dwells there, enthroned. That's reason enough to desire it. And by the way, 
All the other points don't really matter. The reason you want to go to heaven is because God's there. There's pavement of gold. That's pretty cool. There's pillars, these huge pillars, and they're made out of a single pearl. That's pretty cool. But no, no, no. Let's get out of track. God is there, the lover of your soul, the one who died for you. He's there. You'll never be sorry for going to heaven. But there's a lot of places I've been that I was sorry I went there. See, the rest is just gravy. All the other stuff about heaven. I wonder if they have basketball up there. Actually, more importantly, is there fishing? I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting, 531 times, but yet the Bible is kind of mysterious about heaven. We know God will be there, and we have a few details about what it's like. See, we shouldn't crave heaven because of the things that we'll get. We should crave heaven because of who is there. That's the most important point. Deuteronomy 26.15 says this, Look down from your holy habitation. Where God dwells is holiness. That's why it must be born again. Because in your flesh, you are a sinner. You're born into sin. And if you don't get that canceled out, you can't go to heaven. The requirement is absolute holiness. Well, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. No, no, no. That's not the idea. The idea is to receive the righteous robes that Christ wants to give us. And he looks down from his holy habitation from heaven. Bless your people, Israel, and the land which you have given us, just as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. What a great promise to Israel. But do you realize how more wonderful heaven is than any place on earth? I got a few places that are near. And do you have some places like that? They like you go there and it's just so special. My place is Tully, right, Garrett? Tully, good place. <laughs> Nothing compared to heaven. Whatever it is. Isaiah 66, 1, you probably know this one. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. That's a little perspective. What a picture. God uses the earth as his footstool. I would say he's pretty large. His habitation, his dwelling place. Second Chronicles thirty twenty seven says, Then the priests, the Levites, arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. God is holy. And remember that his requirement for us is holy, but you can't muster it up. It's given to you by way of the cross by way of you repenting of your sin and coming and receiving the love of God. So heaven is royal. Heaven is also regal. You may think those are the same terms, but here's what regal means. Of or resembling or fit for a king. That's what regal means. Especially in being resplendent. That's a fun word. Why is it resplendent? Because God and I want to put this in quotes, God built it. Not like we built things around here with a hammer and nail. God, God just is so powerful, he can speak things into existence. But the place is regal. Jeremiah 31 tells us that heaven is immeasurable. First, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, how many of your bodies are being torn down right now? Got aches and pains. I got a little scrape on my knuckle. Isn't it? Can I get some sympathy? Oh, look at that. I got a boo-boo. The house is being torn down, right? That's a striking blow for evolution, seriously. Things are not getting better. They're in decay. Look at me. I'm in decay. I used to have hair and stuff. But if our house is torn down, listen to this, we have a building from God. A house not made with human hands, eternal in the heavens. 
That's awesome. So heaven is regal. God built it. It's immeasurable. It's everlasting. Hebrews 11 uh, verse 10 says this, For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That's cool. God does both. Usually in the construction world, you get an architect, right? The architect draws up the plans, and then the builder goes, hmm, I don't know if that, you know. But usually the same person doesn't do both jobs. But in heaven, he's not only the architect, he designed it. So what does that mean? It means that it's perfect. Like it was in the Garden of Eden until we rebelled. I say we because we like to go, ha, oh, Eve, what a dummy. I can't believe she did that. And then the women give the elbow shot and like, yeah, what about Adam? Yeah, Adam, Adam was also a dummy. But here's the thing. If you were Adam or if you were Eve, guess what? You probably would have done the same thing. Probably would have done the same thing. It's rebellion. Anytime I am not willing to allow the Lord to lead me, I'm in rebellion. And could I just say that it's not smart? Because God loves you and he has vision that you can't possibly see. It's always better to follow the Lord. Not only that, but God devotes those two last chapters, as we said earlier, to, to heaven, to describing it for us. What are some of the details? Well, some of the details are, as we said, there's streets of gold. Gold's pretty valuable. God, like, what are you doing? We used to live in Fruitland Park, and we lived off of what was known as the Red Road. Now, the Red Road, we found, was red because the guy who was going to make the road got a hold of a bunch of red bricks, and he thought to himself, self, how could I make more money if I just use this product? So he ground up the bricks, mixed them in with the asphalt, and then made the road out of it and put a little change in his pocket. But in heaven, God uses gold to pave the roads. Something that's so valuable to us right? Oh, the price of gold. We're always keeping an eye on it. God just uses it to make roads. And I love how he doesn't give us all the details, right? He doesn't describe every single thing that's going to be in heaven. He, he likes, I think, that our minds are going to start thinking about. I wonder what it's like. But that's a detail that's pretty important. The things that are of value here, he uses as pavers. And then there's the pillars of a single pearl, the word says. A single pearl is this ginormous pillar in heaven, in the temple. And then there's a river that's described in Revelation chapter 22. And, and there's this river runs through this tree. And the tree has 12 kinds of fruit, and it bears the fruit four times a year. I know we can do things like, I think we have a lime lemon tree. We're not really sure what it, but... It produces stuff, and they look like limes, but they might be lemons, I'm not sure. But this tree, 12 different kinds of fruit, four times a year. Oh, and the sun? Where's Rick at? Rick did a job this last week, and he was uh, in the sun quite a bit, so don't look directly at him. He's kind of glowing, <laughs> and it might burn your eyeballs. No, he's like, he's like crisp. You won't have to worry about that in heaven. The Bible describes that there will not be a need for a son because God's there and you'll be in his full glory. Those are some amazing details. If you have a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So heaven's royal, it's regal, it's real. From John 14, we're going to get three more R's. 
and I'm doing my best not to do a pirate joke. It says there in John chapter 14, Jesus speaking. Jesus is speaking. Jesus is saying these words to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Fear, anxiety, depression, all these things. Very real, very difficult things. I'm not discounting that, but I'm just saying, let's try Jesus first with those things. Lord, I'm anxious. How about a little confession? I'm fearful. How about a little confession to him? And he says, this is a command actually, right? This is an imperative sentence. You, whoever is reading it, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house. Jesus is telling us that it's his Father's house. If it's his Father's house, Jesus has full right to invite you along. In my Father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen, God is not lying. Jesus, God, very God, He is not lying either. He's saying, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. There's room for a sinner just like you. If I can get in, you can get in. It's roomy. There's plenty of room in heaven. You know, that's, and we've heard that many times. Maybe we are the one that said it. We, oh, I, you get invited to church and you're like, I, no, I can't do that. The, the walls will cave in if I go in there. I'm such a bad sinner. No, they won't. And if they do, they go that way and then people are set free. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. You. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to those he's teaching at that moment, but he's talking to you. I go to prepare a place for you. We have some visitors in our house. So guess what we did? God, we prepared. My wife cooked a bunch of meals. I did a couple things, you know. <laughs> but she's amazing, you know. She's doing this and that, and I'm like, I would have never thought of that. We would have been ordering Kentucky Fried Chicken for sure. <laughs> but she prepared. And the sheets were out. Prepared. And Jesus is saying, I go to prepare a place for you. He's not just sitting up there idle. He's preparing the place for us. And if Jesus is preparing it, man, little chocolates on the pillow maybe. And he says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. <laughs> He's coming again, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. He's coming again soon. Like, w rejoice. Because Heaven is a relief. That's point number four. Heaven is a relief. First of all, he says, let not your heart be troubled. Why not? Because you have a hope in heaven. Everything that we do that is heaven bound or heaven glorifying, you will not lose your reward. Heaven is a relief. Such a relief for a thirsty soul, isn't it? How glorious it's going to be. Man, you guys have been with my family and we've been through the hardest thing that I've ever been through and, and I'm sorry but not sorry because I talk about it a lot. But the fact of the matter is I'm going to see my son. That's a relief. Why? Because he was a good guy? Because he went to church? Because he was a pastor's kid? No, because he had a personal abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. Was he perfect? No. Revelation 21.4 says this, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
You just, you just picture that. Just wiping those tears away. There shall be no more death. Hallelujah. No sorrow. No crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. No more tears. But I wonder if there's going to be some tears of joy. When you see Jesus, I love how people will go, you know, when I get to heaven, I got a few things I got to communicate to the Lord. I got a few questions for him. Um, maybe after 2,000 years and you're still face planted next to his holiness, just like, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. And then you finally can stand up, you're going to be like, and Jesus is like, do you have a question? And you're like, no, nah, I don't remember it. <laughs> you know what else is gone? Temptation. Whew, temptation. You won't even have it. The thought won't even be there. The thought that gives birth to sin won't be there. Sin won't be there. Shame, guilt, all washed away. What a relief. Think about all the emotional, physical, and the spiritual things that have caused pain. Gone. All your selfish motives, all my selfishness, gone. What a relief. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, and I'm reading this to let you know that this is what's going on today, but heaven will be a relief from that because it will stop. Paul writes, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men and women will be lovers of themselves. Recognize any of that? It's in our world today, isn't it? They'll be lovers of money. You see it so many times. Oh, if I just, I just got to get me that bank, got to get me that, get those, you know, whatever the president's names are. Lincoln. That's, what I, that's where I'm at. Give me a Lincoln. What's the guy on the hundred? Benjamins. Thank you. I like to shoot low. Give me a Lincoln. But boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Where's Paul getting this? He's writing this 2,000 years ago. It's almost like he lives here now. Slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. And Paul ends that little, nice little look at the heart of men by saying, from such men, turn away. But what a relief. In heaven, you won't have to turn away from them because they won't be allowed in heaven. If they don't repent of those things, they won't be in heaven doing those things. Because if I go to heaven with my unholiness, I've just spoiled it. Think about a rotten apple. You put a rotten apple in a, in a bushel of apples, what's going to happen to all those apples pretty quickly? Rotten. But heaven is roomy. John 14 told us that, didn't it? That heaven is roomy. Nehemiah 9.6 says this, and he's praying to the God, great missionary book, you alone are the Lord. You made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host. A host is an unnumberable amount of things, whatever it is. And Nehemiah says, with all their host, the angels, the seraphim, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Revelation 7, 9, And after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. Right after Revelation 7, more people are going to get saved. But it is sad because 
one-third of the people are cut off because they will not repent. Why are people going to hell? Because they rejected the free gift of grace given to them in Christ Jesus. What if they didn't know? What if they lived on an island? You don't live on the island. You just heard the gospel truth that many will die, but at the same time, God is sparing and saving whosoever will come. That's pretty amazing. Heaven is roomy. It's got enough room for you. Heaven is also a repository, not that other thing. So what's a repository? If you'll bring up the slide, I got a picture of Fort Knox up there. That's a repository. That's where your gold is stored, everybody. That your money's. isn't it weird that you do have this money and you're like, here, you want this paper? Could I have that whatever it is, that car or whatever? And you just hand them a piece of paper. Well, there's gold that is sealed up there. A repository is a place or building or receptacle where things may be stored. Here's what Matthew 6.20 says. You know where I'm going, don't you? Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Are you allowed to have treasures on earth? Sure. But don't lay them up for yourselves. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. That's another thing heaven doesn't have. Thieves. You ever stolen anything? <laughs> Where's the hands? <laughs> Have you ever told a lie? <laughs> there, there we go. And now you want me to believe you about the thief thing. <laughs> There's no thieves. But that's, if you ever have had something stolen, it like almost physically hurts, doesn't it? It's like, why did you take that from me? But when we lay up our treasures in heaven... Jesus goes on, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys. The point is this. Whatever you do for God, not for yourself. You know, if you, if you come up and you got your little your trumpet on your finger as they, the priest did and like, do 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 I'm tooting my own horn and they would come up and tithe and, and they would bring out their spices you know, and they tithe that, but they keep their money back. That's not getting rewarded. But if we lay up our treasures in heaven, they are safe. Nothing will destroy them. Whatever you do for God, whatever you has done for Him, will remain, and you will be rewarded in heaven for it. That's an amazing thing. You know, I could have a really nice car and my wife, she could back right into it. It almost sounded real, didn't it? But that won't happen in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where, where is your treasure? That, I guess that's the question, isn't it? It's like, what am I really treasuring? And if it's focused on money and position and doing this and doing that, is it for you? Or are you seeking to give God glory through that? Because if it's for you, that's its reward. Whatever you get, you get a big paycheck, you get a nice car, you get a vacation, whatever it is, that is the reward. But if I do it for the Lord, if I do it for the Lord, you won't lose it. You can't lose it. Moss won't destroy it. Rust will not cause it to just go away. Colossians 1.5 says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Wow. Lay up treasures. One of the greatest treasures you have in heaven is the hope of heaven. Hope. It doesn't disappoint, does it? 
It's laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel. See, this isn't Bitcoin. And you might make a lot of money on Bitcoin or whatever the latest investment thing is, but you could also lose your shirt pretty quickly. House prices, they fluctuate, don't they? Yeah. Sometimes you make money on a house, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have to pay to get out of there. Gold and silver, the exchange rates, all of that. But you see, when I invest in heaven, it's 100%. It's safe. And it's way safer than Fort Knox. And our last point, number seven, heaven is reserved. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy... Okay, this weekend, I've given, I, you got homework. Okay, you got homework. And I'm going to check. You have a whole week, but you need to commit this verse to memory. If not for yourself, for a person that you could share this with. What a great verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. You don't have a dead hope. You have a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. What's our inheritance? Heaven. And it's incorruptible. Nothing can corrupt anything in heaven. The word corrupt is like that rotten apple, by the way. And it's undefiled, and that does not fade away. And it's reserved in heaven for you. You who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wow! Reserved in heaven for you. You see, there's some common misconceptions, I'll go over a few, of who can go to heaven and be with God. So long as you are good enough, you're in. Well, my mom and dad, they're precious saints. They go to church all the time. Boom. I'm a legacy. I'm a shoe-in. God allows all people into heaven. I was taught that as a child. Whatever road you want to take, whatever road, however you get there. Sounds nice. Sounds inclusive. But it's not true. If I go to church X, you are in the right spot now, guys. Calvary Chapel, Bellevue. All other churches, mm -mm. this is the only place. That... Can I stop now? Yeah, because yeah. it, it, ugh. But let's be real. There are churches that teach that you can only be saved through them. If I'm a member of the right church, if I do this, if I, if I give enough and they put a plaque on the chair, I'm in. Wrong, 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 and wrong. Galatians 5.21, Ephesians 5, verse 5, and Revelation 22, verse 15. Three verses that all say the same thing. The wicked are excluded from heaven. The wicked are excluded from heaven. Heaven is by reservation only. It's reserved for you. So the question is, how do I get there? Luke 10.20 says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in you that the spirits are subject to you. They were running around and seeing healings and all sorts of stuff. They're like, "Woo! check this out. He's like, no, no, don't rejoice in that. Rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. See, there's a reservation book for heaven. And your name must be on it. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. If your name is in it, it means that you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have repented of your sin and turned to the living God. 
if your name is not found in that book, you will have chosen. God does not send anyone to hell. People choose that route. So my question, and I don't, I'm looking out here and I, but I never know, right? Like, I don't know what's in your heart. Only God knows that. But I would be remiss not to share. Because it's so important. Jesus said, I am the way. He did not say, I am a way. The church I grew up in, that's what they taught. Jesus was a way. And so was Buddha, and so was Muhammad, and so was Zarathustra, or whatever they wanted to come up with, or Dagon. Dagon's a way. No, Jesus said, I am the way. C.S. Lewis rightly reckoned that by saying, that means that he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. I put my faith and trust that he is the Lord. I put my faith and trust in this, not what I think, not what I feel. Got a lot of guys saying, too much of that. Stop it. Well, I feel like, I feel like you should man up and read the word of God. (laughs) I want to share with you the ABCs of salvation because it's so simple and maybe this will help you. First, you need to admit Man, it was that tough for me. I was a good guy. You asked me, I would have told you. I'm a great guy. Just ask me. No, I wasn't. And it was C.S. Lewis, actually, that helped me see that through his book, Mere Christianity. I was reading the Bible. A guy was sharing Jesus with me. And along the same time, I got a hold of this book that I didn't understand. I didn't understand it because I was so good. And then eventually, as I kept reading the book, I realized I'm not good. There's none good. No, not one. None. Then I'm a sinner in need of grace. And if I, if I don't come to that place, I can't see my need for a Savior. See, there's bad news. You've lied. You've stolen. You've committed adultery. You've broken every one of the Ten Commandments. So do you want to continue trying to get through the Ten Commandments, keep saying that you're a good person, when the Ten Commandments screams at you and says, no, no, I'm not a good person. No sinner can go to heaven. I need to admit that first. I need a Savior. What a glorious place to be. It sounds mean, doesn't it? It's like, I don't like what that guy's preaching up there. That guy is, he's a little rough up there. But then I believe. Not just believe vaguely. Let's explain what I believe. Those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. I admit, I'm a sinner. I turn and I believe. I stop believing in myself. I stop believing that, you know, I'll, it'll just magically, you know, I'll get a magic eraser and it'll erase all my sin. No, I believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did, that finished work on the cross, and I confess. Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I did that all by myself. Not even knowing if God was really real, because my prayer was like, God, if you're real, and you could be in that place today, I want to see you in heaven. Here's one of my favorite verses. God is not willing that any should perish. I don't want to hear people saying bad things about my God. He's a forgiving God. But oh, we're a rebellious lot. Pharaoh, many people in the Bible, Judas, just rebellious, rebellious, rebellious. Hey, you're rebellious. I know. 
Well, Jesus will forgive you of all your unrighteousness. I'm not unrighteous. I'm a good guy. You need to admit, believe, and confess. If there's anybody in here that needs the Lord, because you need the Lord. We've seen that the scriptures say that you're not going to heaven, and that's an eternity, and you'll be separated from God because of your own choice, or you could choose Christ today. This isn't a sales pitch. This is the scripture. You can give your life to him today. What a way to open our new church, to know that not only is this your new home, but you have a new home in heaven. So let's close our eyes. We're going to pray. And my words, these words have the power. My words, no. And when I'm praying, and if you want to pray these words, understand you're not praying to me because I can't help you. I can only help you in the sense that I shared the gospel with you. But if you want to give your life to Christ today, if that's you, you just say these words along with me. Mean them in your heart. And God wants to give you heaven. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again from the dead three days later. I believe that you're seated at the right hand of God. I also know and believe that I'm a sinner and I don't want to pay for my sin. I believe that you died for me on that cross 2,000 years ago at Calvary. And I ask you to forgive me, Lord, of all my sin. Father, I ask that you'd be my Lord and my Savior. And I ask that you would teach me how to live for you instead of me, all the rest of the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Admit, believe, and confess. A couple Sundays ago, we had two people give their heart to the Lord. Last Sunday, we had two young girls give their heart to the Lord in the children's ministry. They confessed. I'm going to ask you to do something difficult. If it if you just gave your life to the Lord today, if nobody did, that's okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That means you're all in. It means all the seven things that we talked about, you're just like, oh, it's a relief. It's roomy. It's a repository. All these things. But if you gave your life to the Lord, I'm going to ask you to stand. For the first time ever that you stand and we just recognize that you just became Remember, the angels in heaven are rejoicing if you gave your life to the Lord. Did anybody say that today? Thank you, Jamie. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Most important decision of your life, wasn't it? Praise the Lord. Let me pray for you, Jamie. Father, I just uh, lift up Jamie. Thank you for her bravery, for tipping her over, Lord. Lord, she's been hanging around and I just, you're, you've touched her heart today and she recognized that she needed you fully in her life, Lord. So I just thank you for her bravery and we thank you for, and we rejoice with the angels in heaven that she is now counted, that her name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Lord. Thank you for that and we thank you for today. Lord, you are so awesome. Make us bold, Lord. Help us to be loving to people that don't understand, that are not regenerated, Lord, because the things that come out of some people's mouth just don't make sense, Lord. But you told us that there would be a day of strong delusion. So they're under that, Lord, but you can save them. Your gospel is strong enough to break any hard heart. So we thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for every person that is here. And we rejoice in your salvation. And we rejoice that we're going to see you soon. And we'll get to be with you forever and ever in that wonderful place we've learned about today called heaven. And it's wonderful because you're there. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.